Hello, students. In this video, I would like to give an introduction to the idea of solving equations that have a trigonometric function in them. And I'm going to try to keep it real simple. There are lots of examples elsewhere in the book, in the PowerPoint for our trigonom trigonometry class that have all kinds of complicated examples with all sorts of tricks and ways to try to solve them. But as we're trying to solve these equations, I'd like to have us think about the big picture of what's going on and what it means to find all the solutions for a trigonometric equation. So just to begin with a simple example, let's say we have sine of x is equal to 1 half. So like the best of simple equations, we could almost solve this with guess and check. We could just think about what values of x for the angle put into sine you would need to have for this to be true. So let's begin with that. So we know sine of x is the y value on a unit circle if you have an angle of x. And we know that to get a y value of 1 half, you can imagine having a line through the 1 half value of y. So if I have y is equal to 1 half, then I can look to see where on the unit circle that would happen. And I can identify the point here and the point here. And so if I need to have an angle x so that I have this y value of 1 half, as we have learned, this would be x equal to, we could do 30 degrees or pi over 6, but keeping things in radians for now, pi over 6 is a value in which we would get sine of pi over 6 equals 1 half. We can also see from the image that there's another place over here where you would have 1 half. And so if I think of that angle as well, then this angle extends all the way over to there. And then we have a uh, pi over six as the reference angle. So I could still have this reference angle be pi over six, but then that means that the angle all the way over to get to that point on the unit circle would be five pi over six. Now, these are a couple of values we could have simply from having um, a table of values for sine x, and we could look them up and see where you get 1 half. Uh, but if we visually think about this on the circle, it helps us to realize that even though when I look at a unit circle, I can find two places where sine of x would equal to 1 half, we could also envision that the rotational angle around the circle would land on those points again if we lapped around and came back to those places on the circle by adding two pi. And so the real possible solutions for this equation are infinite because I can have, again, solutions are any value of the variable that satisfies the equation, that makes the equation two, true. So even though I have a couple of them here, we know from our angular measurements that if I do laps around the circle, I'll hit these same points again, and I'll get these exact same um, results every time. So pi over 6 is a solution, but then I can add any multiple of 2 pi to that. And so we would typically write that as plus or minus 2 pi times n or something like that. And so in addition to those infinitely many solutions, I can also take the five pi over six solution and add any multiple of two pi to that as well. So here I'm writing an n where n could just be a whole number. And so in this way, what we'll first recognize about trigonometric equations is that because trigonometric functions themselves are periodic and repeat the same values over and over and over again, that in general leads us to deal with the fact that 
when you have a trigonometric equation, then it's typical that you will have infinitely many solutions to that equation. If there's one angle that makes the sine come out to be one half, there's an infinite other collection of angles that will do the same thing. And so we have to keep this in mind from the very get-go as we begin to think about how to solve equations with trig functions in them, that it is typical that there will be infinitely many solutions. Now, one of the ways that this is dealt with is that sometimes you are asked to find solutions that are within a certain angular range. So they might have said in this problem, you know, solve this equation for x, but this might be where um, we'll say zero is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to two pi. So if we had this restriction on x, that would mean that of all the infinitely many solutions for x, I only want the ones that are within one rotation on the circle from zero to two pi. And that would mean that I would then discard everything that I got by going around the circle again and again and again. And I would only have the two solutions I had, pi over six and five pi over six, because any others would then be larger than two pi or less than zero if I added or subtracted some multiple of two pi. So it's quite possible we'll have an equation that does not give a restriction on the variable. And then there's usually infinitely many solutions. Or it's also quite common that there'll be some restriction on the variable. And then we have to figure out which of those infinitely many solutions would be within the restricted range that was provided. So this is a pretty complicated situation to deal with. Now, I wanted to have us try to think about this uh, in another visual way. So I use this circle to help us think about how you could keep repeating around the circle. But now that we've worked with like the graph of the sine x function, let's consider the same equation where I imagined not on a circle, but just graphing the sine x function. Sine x function. So I've clipped this from Desmos. And what we're looking at here is that the red graph is the sine x function. And then this green line cutting across the graph is the line where y equals 1 half. So if in this situation I was trying to do the same thing, if I was trying to solve and find where the sine x function ends up equaling 1 half, well, that would be all the places where the graph of the sine x function meets the graph of the constant function 1 half. So we can see the solutions everywhere these two graphs cross. So here's a solution. And that's the very first one after 0. And so we will know just from the work we did above that that's where x is equal to pi over 6. And similarly, the next solution, which happened a little bit before pi, and we can see it on the graph is here. So that's the solution where we have five pi over six for x. But what we can see from this graph in just sort of a visually different way is that we also have solutions over here and here and here and here. And this wave and line extend on indefinitely in the positive and negative x directions. So we can sort of imagine that way why there's infinitely many solutions. There's infinitely many places where this wave crosses that line. It just keeps crossing it, coming back, crossing it, coming back. And that each one of those solutions that matches the previous one, we can think of as being by adding plus or minus 2 pi. If I add 2 pi to the first solution, I get the next one on the next cycle of the wave. And similarly, the place where I hit the, the line on the way down from the top, if I add 2 pi to that, then I would get this solution over here. Or similarly, we could go backward and imagine that I could simply subtract 2 pi from either of these. And that we could just keep doing that, add 2 pi, add 2 pi. So you can envision it as doing laps around the circle to repeatedly get all of these solutions. Or you can envision it that if you go further down the graph of the wave of the sine x function, you'll find more places where it ends up getting to a height of one half, one way or another. And so this 
hopefully gives us a sense of how we need to take in to take into account in some way the fact that originally there might be a couple of key solutions within one lap around the circle, but then we can then extend those to all the other solutions that occur either further to the right or to the left on the graph of sine x or, or occur because we lapped around the circle and came across those same points again on a unit circle. So with this in mind, we then want to imagine sort of this general strategy of how we solve an equation like this, where maybe it's not so obvious or maybe where it's not so friendly. So let's say we didn't have these images to work with. And instead we were just looking at the equation in, uh, uh, just written by itself here. And so what we've, been, what we've just introduced at the beginning of this chapter is the idea of an inverse function. And the fact that an inverse function has, in order to exist, has to have a very restricted domain. So if, for example, we have a, an equation with the sine x in it, and we want to isolate the, the x and get the sine by, um, get the x by itself and get rid of the sine, well, what I would want to do typical to the way we solve equations is I would want to do the same thing to both sides in such a way that I get the x variable by itself. And so the same way that if x was squared, I would square root both sides. Well, if x is in a sine function, then I take the sine inverse of both sides. And that basically the sine inverse, when applied to the sine function, those cancel out. And I'm left with the x variable, like just like we want when we're solving an equation. And then on the other side, I have the answer for x is the sine inverse of 1 half. However, when we do this, we've, we've, um, we've assumed a drastic limitation. Because what we want to know when we apply the sine inverse function is that the sine is to use the sine inverse function, we've had to put a big restriction on the possible angles we can get for x. So we want to remember that the, um, the sine inverse function has a range. So if I'll maybe put it over here, the sine inverse function has a range, meaning output values of, oops, negative pi over two to pi over two. So what that means is that it's only going to give us answers in that range. On the circle, it's the zero to pi over two is quadrant one, the zero to negative pi over two is quadrant four. So it's only going to find the sine angled val the angle values in quadrants one or four that would allow sine to produce the value that we gave the inverse. So when we put in sine inverse of one half, the inverse function is only going to give us the result of the first quadrant. And so that means that it would just give us a single value, in this case, the pi over six value. And that is a valid solution. If I plug pi over six into the original equation, I get one half equals one half. It's a solution, it works. But what we can see from our previous discussion is that we've missed a whole bunch of solutions here. Not only could we get other solutions by adding any multiple of two pi to the pi over six solution that inverse sine gave us, but we also missed the other solution that occurred in the first lap around the circle of five pi over six. We missed that one completely. And then, of course, all multiples of two pi of that solution. And so when you use the inverse trig function, like inverse sine, you get what we call sort of a root solution, a root solution. And what we want to do is take the root solution, which we know is within one circle of pi 
or certainly in one of these four quadrants on one trip around. It could be in the negative direction, like in a negative angle. But we want to take that root solution and come up with another solution on the unit circle that we can then also add multiples of 2 pi to get all the solutions. And so for each trig function, it's going to be a little bit different. And so if I go to the graph, for example, and I look at the root solution here that I would get from the inverse sine function, it's at pi over six. So I got too much stuff on here. Let me erase some of this here. So if I'm just looking at this original situation of the graph, then we got this solution here, which was pi over six. But I want to find this one over here. So how do I find that? Well, we're going to use that by relying on the symmetry of the sine function. So the sine function crosses the x-axis here at pi. And the up and down between 0 and pi of the sine function is perfectly symmetric around the middle. And so this first place that we hit 1 half if I think of how far that was in from the left border here, that was in pi over six from zero. So this is zero plus pi over six. We move pi over six to the right from zero. So by symmetry, the other solution there will move left from the, the border on the right there by the same amount. This will be the borders at pi, but then you move to the left by subtracting pi over six. So the first solution was pi over six inward from the left to the right, from the left edge of the sort of up and down symmetric bump of the sine curve. We moved to the right from the left border pi over six. So the other way, when we're coming back down in a symmetric way, we will be inward to the left of the right border at pi by pi over six, and pi minus pi over six is five pi over six. And that's why that's the other solution. So in general, if I have any solution here, I can imagine if I have a root solution that I can find another root solution by looking symmetrically at the graph to see where that would be. The way that would look on the circle up here, is that this angle here above zero was pi over six. And that means over here, symmetrically, I would go up this way, pi over six as well. But in, on the left side, when I'm going up pi over six, I'm reducing the angle from pi by pi over six, leading me to a total angle all the way over of five pi over six. So I do think most students are going to have the best success at finding these other these root solutions and using them to get all of them by thinking either graphically on a circle or graphically on the wave version of a graph of sine x on a typical graph. So for example, let's say I had uh, another number that wasn't so friendly. So let's say I wanted to find um, Let's say as an X example, just to be right in line this, with this one, what if instead I had the sine of X, instead of be equal, being equal to one half or 0.5, let's say it was equal to 0 0.6. So that will be a little bit higher up on the graph above, instead of being where Y is equal to one half, it would be where Y is equal to 0.6. And so maybe up here somewhere. And there are two solutions here as well within this first quadrant. Uh, I mean, within this first circle, on a one in quadrant one and one in quadrant two on a first rotation of the circle. The thing is, they're not going to be a nice number that we would get off of our table of values because we didn't have any nice quick angles like pi over two, pi over four, pi over three. None of those gave us 0.6. We got one half, we got square root of two over two, things like that. But it is just a number. And 
we can use the inverse function, the inverse sine function on our calculator to get the decimal value in radians of x as close as we want. So what I would do is I would still solve this equation by taking the sine inverse of both sides and the sine and the sine inverse would cancel. And then what I would get is that X is equal to the inverse sine of 0 0.6. And I don't know what that number is. It's obviously something a little bit larger than pi over six because pi over six gives me one half. And if I increase the angle a little past five over pi over six, I'll get up to 0 0.6 at some point. But at this point, let's just say that could then be punched on a calculator. There is a solution. Like if I have square root of seven, that's a solution. Maybe I don't know that exact um, approximate decimal to six places, but I could type square root of seven on a calculator. I'll get a solution. I can type sine inverse of 0 0.6 on a calculator, and it'll give me a solution to whatever de decimal accuracy I want. But as we were just saying, this is one solution. So this is like a root, whoops. This is like a root solution. So if I have this one solution, I wanna recognize that there's another um, root solution on the other side of the circle. <laughs> Over here, symmetrically, over there, there's another solution. And whatever this angle is that I went to get to the first solution, I'll get the other solution if I subtract that angle from pi to go in the other direction. And so that means that I get another solution. Let's change colors again here, maybe too many colors here. I'll have another solution by taking pi and subtracting whatever the angle was provided by sine inverse of 0 0.6. And I could punch those on a calculator and get some decimal numbers. I won't get nice radian measurement angles, but I'll be able to get these solutions. And so these will be the two solutions that occur within one zero to two pi circulation on the unit circle. And then if I want all solutions, I simply take those two root solutions <coughs> and I add multiples of two pi. So all solutions would then be sine inverse of 0 0.6 plus, and I think the simplest way they'll put it is two k pi or 2 n pi, where the, the letter n or k is any integer. So there'll be that initial root solution plus all multiples of 2 pi. And the secondary solution, which would be pi minus the first one, and then that angle can also have any multiple of two pi added or subtracted. So I would say where k is any integer. All right, so this, this is the basic idea, and I know it doesn't look all that basic, but this is the, the heart of what you have to keep in mind when you're trying to solve equations with trig functions in them. The trig functions are periodic. So in general, if there's one angle that works in the trig function to make the equation work, then there's a whole bunch of others. And that the simplest way is that if you can get on any ro single rotation around the circle, if you can get the solutions that work on one rotation of the circle, often there's more than one, then you can add multiples of two by to those to get all the solutions. And then if you need to then just take the ones within a restricted domain, you can always do that. But if you can find all the solutions, 
then you'll always be able to provide the ones in a particular domain, or if they ask for all of them, then you can provide those, and there'll be some sort of a notation involving multiples of 2 pi to do that. So it would work similarly for cosine, because cosine has a period of 2 pi. If there was a tangent in the function, well, then the tangent function repeats every period of pi. So you would find a root solution and then add, it, add any multiples of pi to be able to repeat that solution or to find other solutions that repeat that same value in the tangent function, et cetera. And so there's some challenge to be had here. There is some, um, there's some challenge in keeping all of these things in mind. I believe the, the book and the slides jump a little bit too quickly into using identities and a bunch of algebra to manipulate equations with trig functions in them to solve for the variable. And they kind of go too quickly over this core idea. So I'm hoping this introductory video, just focusing on the simple like sine x function and a simple equation and how the solutions for one sine x function can be found by looking graphically at what's going on and then extending root solutions into all the solutions that are possible. And then we can apply those same ideas when we look at some of the examples provided in the book or on the slides or on the homework assignments. So that's what I wanted to show in this first video. I'll shoot some more videos uh, just demoing some of the problems that they have. But regularly as we do those, I'll be coming back to these ideas and trying to keep this big picture in mind about how we find all the solutions for a trigonometric equation. I hope this helps. Keep up the hard work and come to me if you need any help. I'll see you when I see you.